بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين uh, Thank you all for joining us as we continue with our series of learning practical aspects of the story of Prophet Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام And as we mentioned earlier uh, in the previous classes when we say learning practical aspects uh, we're not doing uh, the story of Prophet Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام justice because his whole story is practical and is, and is for us to learn from. Um, so we continue on. Um, in the first session, we gave an introduction of the seerah. And then the following one, we gave a quick walkthrough of his story. And then, alhamdulillah, in the two most previous uh, classes, the first one, we took an attribute of his character and we spoke about it, which was his perseverance and him being goal oriented and how. SubhanAllah, he started with, you know, just himself um, with the message, receiving the message at the age of 40 by himself with no believers yet. And then 23 or, you know, 20 to 23 years later, um, over 100,000 believers had entered the fold of Islam and how that took strong perseverance uh, and resilience uh, to reach that goal. And now, SubhanAllah, with over, you know, close to 2 billion Muslims um, uh, believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam. So that was the first attribute that we spoke about. The second one that we spoke about was uh, very different and that was uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa uh, humor and playfulness in areas that permitted for it and allowed for it. And we uh, highlighted a very important point which is being able to balance uh, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being serious in acts of worship when it deemed to be serious. And then also being able to balance that with times of enjoying uh, the company of your family and friends and how it's important to be able to do both and be able to separate them um, and not take Islam lightly and be playful in matters that deemed uh, for us to be serious. Um, and then we had mentioned a very famous hadith narrated by Anas radiallahu anhu about how three men came to the uh, mothers, uh, to, to our beloved mothers, and uh, they said that they would, you know, not sleep and pray all night. And then they mentioned that they would fast all year. Um, and they also had mentioned, uh, in addition to fasting all year and uh, praying all night, they also mentioned that they would not marry a woman. And when Prophet Muhammad heard about this, he completely refuted it and said, you know, I am closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I am most fearful of him. I fear him the most. And yet um, I will uh, do the opposite of that. I will pray and I will sleep. I will fast and I will break my fast. And I will also marry a woman. Um, so that balance was, was crucial. And, and we, alhamdulillah, we highlighted that in our last class. And today... Uh, inshallah, the next attribute that we will discuss is Prophet Muhammad والسلام, is forgiveness. Uh, his forgiveness to others, to those around him, to the disbelievers that harmed him um, over the span of his lifetime and over the span of his message. And I'm sure as we all reflect on this, we, we're very familiar with many, many stories um, of his forgiveness. But let me start with how um, our beloved mother Aisha described him. Um, in a Tirmidhi, when yeah, she was asked to describe Prophet Muhammad, والسلام, she said that he was neither vulgar nor veil, neither loud, nor did he return evil with evil. Rather, he would forgive when evil was done to him. Um, so she, you know, she she had a few words to summarize his character uh, and his behavior and uh, she spent a considerable amount of that uh, mentioning how he would not return evil with evil, but rather he would forgive uh, those that, you know, wronged him or did evil to him. Um, and now to take a few examples of his story, uh, I start with one that we've mentioned before, and that is uh, the story of Aqtaif, where after many years of hardship in Mecca, um, the companions uh, were under severe hardship and, and abuse. Um, and, this, and then this was after the year of, of, of great sorrow to Prophet Muhammad where he lost his dear wife 
Khadija and his uncle Abu Talib, um, he, he sought refuge in, in other areas. Uh, and one of them, he went to a Ta'if, you know, which was, uh, you know, they say 50 kilometers or so away. And he did so on his bare feet. Um, and once he, he reached there and he spoke to the leaders of a Ta'if, not only did they refute him and, uh, you know, decide not to follow his message, but they commanded the peasants of a Ta'if those on the streets to throw stones and rocks um, on Prophet Muhammad And as they were throwing stones and rocks and after that had taken place and um, his, 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 his feet and, and his body was bleeding, uh, the angels came to him and they asked him and they told him that, you know, they, they, they could punish those of a ta'if um, and they asked him to make dua and, you know, what, what, what he wanted. You know, they basically asked him, you can now ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will uh, respond. Um, and one would think that after receiving that sort of treatment from those people, that an ordinary man would, would want um, revenge um, and would want, you know, an eye for an eye or, you know, at least get the same treatment that, that he received. But Prophet Muhammad was not concerned with that. His concern was he was hopeful that amongst those people, a Muslim or a believer would come about. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them for that they do not know. Uh, that was his concern. His concern was to grow um, his, his following and that this message reached as many uh, people as possible. Um, so that was the story of a Ta'if. And then, as we know, many years later, uh, when uh, 20 plus years later, when Prophet Muhammad والسلام, and his companions returned to Mecca, uh, the opening of Mecca or the conquest of Mecca, at that time, there were over 10,000 companions. And as Prophet Muhammad, it was narrated as Prophet Muhammad was entering Mecca, he, he was putting his head down, being humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one would think that after 20 years of hardship and mistreatment by those that disbelieved in him, that Prophet would not forgive them and would treat them in the same manner that they treated him. But no, he, he, he forgave them. And he said, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, ma tadhunnun anni fa'ilun bikum. He said, Oh, oh, Quraysh, oh, the people of Quraysh, what do you think I am going to do with you? What do you think my treatment will be to you? Then he said, after, you know, waiting for them to contemplate over that, he said, I will tell you what my brother Yusuf, alayhi salam, told his brothers. He said, go, you are forgiven. He told them that they are forgiven after all the hardship that they had done to many of the companions. And one of those was Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl, the son of Abu Jahl. As many scholars would describe him as the Pharaoh of this ummah, um, the Pharaoh of, of the time of Prophet Muhammad Ikrima, his son, when he came to the companions and Prophet Muhammad Prophet Muhammad had told his companions to not call Ikrimah by the son of Abu Jahl. He told his companions, be careful, don't call him by the son of Abu Jahl, which means, you know, the father of ignorance. So he, he, he wanted, uh, he wanted Ikrimah to feel welcomed into the fold of Islam. And that was his concern. Um, even after the treatment that the companions had received from the disbelievers, uh, that kind of treatment that Prophet ﷺ gave to those disbelievers, that was one of the biggest reasons why they entered and accepted Islam, seeing the mercy of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and seeing the mercy of this great religion. Another story to highlight is during the Battle of Uhud, where one of the disbelievers had dug a hole um, in the battlefield, and Prophet Muhammad ﷺ fell in that hole. Um, and he was wearing a helmet at the time. And as he fell in that, in that, in that hole that the disbeliever had dug in, that helmet came closer to his face and to his head. 
And then the disbeliever struck a prophet والسلام, with his sword. And at that point, the helmet came even closer and closer to the point that the nails of it came and penetrated his cheek. And then the companions rushed to the prophet. And in particular, um, Sayyidina Abu Ubaidah, um, one of the one of the, the the highest of companions, he came and he and he started taking the nails out of the cheek of Prophet Hassan with with his teeth to the point where his teeth would fell out, would would fell off uh, would fall out, and then at that point Prophet Muhammad ﷺ raised his hands, and the companions around him Sayyidina Abu Bakr thought that Prophet Muhammad would be making dua against the disbelievers, um, but again. Prophet Muhammad, in this time where his face is bleeding, his face is punctured um, at, in a battlefield against the disbelievers, against those that harmed him and his family and the companions. He says, He says again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive my people for they do not know. Um, SubhanAllah. Like as, as, as we reflect on this, can you imagine being in a battlefield against those that not only disbelieved in your message, but harmed you and tortured your people. And then a man that just dug a hole to kill you and just struck you with a sword and your face is bleeding. And you raise your hands and what do you say? Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive my people for they do not know, subhanAllah. Another story to mention, um, and this, you know, we, I think we most of us might've heard of when we were younger, is Prophet Muhammad was traveling with his companions. Um, and it was during the time, you know, where people would nap halfway through the day. And a disbeliever approached the Prophet Muhammad as he was napping. And he took his sword out and he placed it over the neck of Prophet Muhammad. And then Prophet, you know, uh, you know, woke up and saw that this man had placed the sword on his neck. And then the disbeliever said, Man yamna'uka minni l'an. He said, who is to protect you or come in between you and I? Who is going to protect you from me right now? And then Prophet Muhammad calm and collected said, Allah. And then the, the sword fell out of the disbeliever's hand, instantly fell out of the disbeliever's hand. And Prophet Muhammad picked up the sword and placed it on his neck. And he said, Man yamna'uka minni l'an. Who is to now stop you or who's to stop me? from you, from harming you right now. And then he said, Kun khayra akhir, be, best, um, be the best taker, forgiver. Um, and then Prophet Muhammad salam, let him go. He forgave him. Um, he let the sword go and he let him go um, after this man had come and placed the sword right on his neck. And the last story that, I, that I'd like to mention, and inshallah with it comes a very important lesson, is the story of Al-Ifik. Um, of the rumors um, that had spread about the, the character and chastity of our dear beloved mother Aisha radiallahu anha. Um, and one of those that had spread the rumor um, was a, a companion, Mustah, um, who was, um, his mother was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, uh, her mother, his mother was his cousin. So he was a relative to Abu Bakr, and it was also known that Abu Bakr would spend on him um, because Mustah was not in the best financial situation. Uh, and he was uh, one of the companions that had made hijrah to Medina and was still trying to uh, get used to the living situation there, but was, was in need of a financial aid and assistance. So Abu Bakr would spend on him. Um, and then during this time where this rumor had spread about the character of our dear beloved mother Aisha, Mustah had fell into that trap and was one of those companions um, that had uh, spread that rumor as well. Um, and then, you know, weeks and months later, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran that, um, that uh, our dear beloved mother, um, her character um, was pure and she had nothing to do with, with those rumors that had spread, and those rumors were false. Um, when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu heard about that and he knew about that, he swore to Allah that he would never give Mustah any financial assistance. And then afterwards, verses of the Quran were revealed 
um, that included from Surah An-Nur that included وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ uh, Verses from Surah An-Nur were revealed um, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, was, was telling uh, the companions um, that forgive those, um, do you not want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive for you, uh, to forgive you just as you forgive for those around you? And then um, Abu Bakr radiallahu um, anhu in, uh, in Tafsir ibn Kathir, he says, Bala wallahi in, in, inna nuhibbu an taghfira lana. He says, um, uh, indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, we want, we, we love for you to forgive for us. Um, so the reason I mentioned this, this story here is um, in the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights that um, do you not want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? Um, by you forgiving others, um, do you not want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? And, you know, oftentimes as we contemplate or we, you know, we're harmed by those around us, um, you know, it's very hard for us to let go. And it's very hard for us to say, I forgive you for the wrongdoings that you did to me or to my family. But a very important point here to remember is, um, do you, when, when, when you're in that situation where someone harmed you, whether it's physically, emotionally, or harmed your family, one key piece to help here, in my opinion, is for you to remember that the enormous you know, wrongdoings and sins that you have done over the years, and do you not want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you for those sins that you have committed? And that is, that is what is mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this verse, that do you not want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you to forgive you for what you had done? And if so, then it is best for you to forgive those that have harmed you. Uh, so I, I say that, and I think it's very important for us to reflect on that and to understand that one of our biggest goals that we hope to achieve is the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what we do every day uh, on several occasions. We make dua and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. And part of that, and part of um, you know, reaching that goal is forgiving those around us that have harmed us, um, whether they're very close to us, whether they're, they're far away from us, whether they're part of our family, they're at our workplace, um, they're our friends. And sometimes it might be harder to forgive our family and friends, um, but you know, those are the ones that are closest to us. And, and uh, as such, it's probably most important for us to forgive them and maintain that family relationship um, as we strive to do. Um, so, Zakumullah Khair for joining us and uh, for being a part of this discussion. Um, I think at this point, inshallah, uh, we'll open up the discussion and um, in the hopes of reflecting on, on what forgiveness means to you and uh, discussing um, how some of these stories and events that have taken place place in, this, in the time Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi how you might have connected to some of these stories and how maybe if, if you'd like to share how, you, how you've overcome, um, let's say, disputes with those around you and what has helped you forgive them uh, in the hopes of seeking forgiveness from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. So again, Jazakumullah Khair, and now we'll open it up for discussion. Um, I can add a comment if that's okay. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, Cynthia. Um, I think when you were talking about forgiveness, um, I think there's a difference between saying I forgive you and having sincere forgiveness in your heart. And um, Allah will hold us accountable for sincerity and our forgiveness as well. So I would say you don't know that you've truly forgiven someone until you can say with confidence that you don't have an ounce of um, negative feeling of any kind towards this person in your heart. So, you know, doing what it takes to get there, um, like essentially kind of cooling yourself down and being willing to forgive that person and it will take, um, might take some time. For some people, it might take some level of action. For some people, it might take some level of dialogue. But remember that you haven't, you shouldn't even say that you've truly forgiven someone until you can say with honesty that you don't hold an ounce of anything against that person in your heart. Because we really don't have a right to, you know, like we, we're all making mistakes. We all, you know, everyone's hurt someone in their life. It's not like any of us are perfect. So having, I guess, a level of sincerity in our, us um, saying that we forgive someone too. Yeah, Jazakallah khair for sharing that, Cynthia. Um, and to, to add on that, one thing that comes to mind as well is the difference between 
someone that might forgive a friend or a family member, um, but then oftentimes remind them of what they had done to them um, versus forgiving and forgetting um, and not you know, making a comment um, to remind that person of what they had done. Um, so yeah, just look like for sharing that. I think that's also important to know and to remember. Mohsin, would you like to bless us with, with, with your um, inshallah input? No, I actually had a question. Uh, you know, the student doesn't talk when the teacher is there. So, um, but I had a question, you know, we're, you know, forgiveness is a very, very, uh, you know, praiseworthy virtue. And, uh, you know, it's something that we aim in our life to reach to that point that we can forgive people. But are there situations where, you know, uh, even maybe in the Sira or something like that, where, you know, forgiveness you know, you can forgive someone, but you cannot, like, you don't necessarily forget about it, if that makes sense. Like, you, there are some situations, some crimes, some uh, actions that you just cannot forgive. Is there some concept like that in Islam? Where you cannot forget or you cannot forgive? You, like, it's, it's okay if you don't forgive or forget. Yeah, so um, upon just, you know, brief, uh, you know, research and, and putting this together, um, you'll see that in, in a lot of verses, and my point here is not to reach conclusions and such, um, but inshallah, I, I hope to address your question. Uh, you'll see in, in, in verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, gives you the right to retaliate. Uh, like a sayya, a wrongdoing, um, you have the right to retaliate with the same amount. But some of the scholars have commentated that it's very difficult to give the ex exact same punishment or retaliation that the person has given you. And oftentimes not being able to give that same exact amount or you know, retaliation um, will be a shortcoming and you will be held accountable for that. Um, so you are um, allowed to do so. However, you will see in many ver verses that Allah follows that mention with forgiveness and how forgiveness is better and how if you strive for forgiveness you will be rewarded more um so the, i hope i hope that's answered your question like it's allowed and it's it's permissible um but we should strive for forgiveness as that is rewarded more so yeah that, that, thank you yeah jazakallah khair for sharing that Mohsen. um yeah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, like forgiveness is, is, is definitely, you know, can be easy at some points, but sometimes with those close to us and family members, if something's been going on for months or years and um, it's associated with, um, you know, not, not just um, hardship or not just, um, not, not only is it associated with hardship, but in, in times w where a person also you nas like he he or she gets others to view you cer a certain way or gets others to also harm you. I, I I can definitely see that very hard to to forgive, um, and that's why like we were discussing right now, Mohsen, it's not an obligation for people um, to forgive, but when you forgive, the great reward and compensation that you get for doing so is tremendous. Um, so we all, and inshallah, we all strive to, to reach that and uh, be forgiving of others around us. Um, it's definitely a, a test that's not easy and, you know, we don't ask to be in that test, um, but it comes with great reward. Um, so would anyone else like to, like to share or reflect on how forgiveness has been part of their life or what it means to them or how can we implement practical aspects of forgiveness in our lives. But alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, jazakumullah khair for sharing, um, for, for joining us today as well. Um, I hope that inshallah was beneficial to all of us. And uh, inshallah, we will resume our, our class, our series on uh, next Tuesday at 5.30. Hopefully you can join the Zoom so you can be a part of the discussion. And inshallah at that point, we'll visit another key attribute of Prophet Muhammad character. Uh, Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.